We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one from Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Presenting officer, last week I asked the First Minister about the Justice Secretary's involvement in the decision to prevent the Chief Constable from returning to work. She said nine times that all Michael Matheson did was ask questions of the Scottish Police Authority's decision. But in evidence to this morning's audit committee, the former chair of the SPA revealed that Mr Matheson's involvement went far beyond that. He said that in their private meeting, the Justice Secretary told him that the SPA had made a bad decision. Which version of events is true? First Minister. I have uh, heard extracts of, of this morning's committee session. I haven't uh, managed to listen to all of it. But I don't think uh, Ruth Davidson is correct in her characterisation of the evidence that was heard this morning. Uh, Andrew Flanagan uh, said, uh, for example, uh, that the Justice Secretary uh, did not request him to change his decision. What he did was ask questions about the steps that had been taken. Uh, he also uh, expressly said that, that he wasn't directed by the Justice Secretary. As I said last week, there is a clear distinction here uh, between the operational independence of uh, the SPA and, of course, the police uh, in matters that no Justice Secretary should intervene in, uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the proper role of a Justice Secretary in making sure that due process is followed. Uh, and Michael Matheson asked legitimate questions uh, about the steps that had been taken uh, leading up to the decision to ask the Chief Constable to return to work. For example, had Perk been asked whether or not his return to work would compromise the ongoing investigation? Secondly, whether the senior command uh, had been notified. And we heard the uh, acting chief constable say earlier in the week that that wasn't the case. Uh, and thirdly, whether there had been plans put in place for the welfare of officers who had raised concerns. And the reason, uh, as I heard it this morning, Andrew Flanagan felt he had no option but to change his decision was that he couldn't answer those questions about process. So it is entirely legitimate uh, and uh, I think the public would have expected the Cabinet Secretary to do what he did. And I, I come back finally, Presiding Officer, to the point that Ruth Davidson couldn't address last week. Uh, if uh, the, the position of Ruth Davidson is that the Justice Secretary should not have asked these legitimate questions, is she saying that she thinks the Chief Constable should have returned to work without any of these issues yeah. being properly explained? Because I'm prepared to bet, Presiding Officer, if that had happened, Ruth Davidson would have been standing up in this chamber saying how outrageous that was. And in those circumstances, she might actually have been right. Ruth Davidson. The evidence that emerged this morning might be inconvenient for the First Minister, but she cannot pretend that it does not contradict her earlier answers. Because the former SPA chair was asked this morning whether he felt the Cabinet Secretary had made a value judgment on the decision, and he said yes. Then just hours after their one-to-one, -one, Michael Matheson hauled the SPA chair back in for another meeting, this time with civil servants, where he then raised issues of process which would prevent the Chief Constable's return. The SPA chair called it a one-sided meeting, and he said that he felt he had no choice but to reverse the decision of his independent board. I changed my mind based on the Cabinet Secretary being unhappy. So the independent chair of an independent body has two meetings with the Justice Secretary, where in the first, he's told he's made a bad decision, and after the second, he's left in no doubt that he has to reverse it. How can that possibly tally with what SNP ministers have claimed in recent weeks? First Minister. But the key aspects of evidence are clearly inconvenient for Ruth Davidson because, as I said earlier on, Andrew Flanagan clearly said that he it hadn't been requested by the Justice Secretary to change his decision and he wasn't directed to do so. Questions were asked and as I said last week and I repeat again today, I absolutely am of the view that the Justice Secretary was right to ask those questions. Now, again, I would invite Ruth Davidson to perhaps address this point. If she doesn't take the view that the decision to invite the Chief Constable to return to work without asking Perk if it would compromise an ongoing investigation, without telling uh, the Acting Chief Constable and the rest of the Senior Command, and without putting in place any plan for the welfare of officers 
who'd raised uh, concerns and made complaints. So she doesn't think that was uh, a defective decision. Is it her position that that was a good decision yeah. and that the Chief Constable the following day should have returned to work? Uh, I think it was right to ask those questions. And again, I, I put it to the Chamber uh, and I put it to the Scottish people that if those questions hadn't been asked, if the Justice Secretary uh, hadn't asked any of those questions and the next morning the Chief Constable had turned up to report for work at Tully Allen, uh, Ruth Davidson and other opposition leaders Absolutely. would have come to this Absolutely. chamber demanding statements and no doubt demanding uh, the Justice Secretary consider his position. There is rank hypocrisy at play here and I think everybody can see it. Ruth Davidson. The First Minister asked me what I would have done. I would have made sure that my Justice Secretary let this Parliament and this country know about the decisions that he was making. Because here's the most damning thing of all, Presiding Officer. It's that now, on the 25th of January, we are still having to piece together the details of what happened at the beginning of November when this government was involved in one of the most important policing decisions it has taken since coming to office. Only now are we getting formal evidence that the Justice Secretary was absolutely instrumental in preventing the Chief Constable's return. But if it hadn't been for reports in the press, the whole thing would have been kept under wraps and this Parliament would have been kept in the dark. Presiding Officer, we were told when the National Force was set up that transparency would be its watchword. Can the First Minister really stand there and claim that this episode has shown that to be true? First Minister. Actually, I, th I think we're getting a clear picture today that in the unlikely event that Ruth Davidson had been uh, or was First Minister, the Chief Constable would have come back to work that day without any relevant questions being asked. That is not the kind of governance the people of Scotland expect and deserve. But on this issue um, about what Parliament knows, there is nothing Ruth Davidson has brought to Parliament today that is different to what she brought to Parliament last week. Last week. And the reason for that is because there is nothing in what we heard this morning that changes what was already known. Because the Justice Secretary came to this Parliament and gave a full statement and answered questions from across the Chamber on exactly what had happened. And nothing that we have heard since then has changed uh, the facts that the, the Justice Secretary put to Parliament. And of course, we also had a debate in this chamber yesterday brought by the Tories where they lost the vote because they hadn't made the argument that they are trying to make. The point here, the point here is that the Justice Secretary, discharging his responsibilities, asked legitimate questions. And if those who are saying that he shouldn't have asked those legitimate questions are really taking that position, then what they have to explain to the Scottish people is why they think it would have been right for the Chief Constable to return to work uh, with no consultation with the organisation that is carrying out an investigation, without the Acting Chief Constable even being told about it and without any concern for the welfare of other officers. Now that may be Ruth Davidson's position, that is not my position uh, and my position is the Justice Secretary acted entirely appropriately. Ruth Davidson. Let's cut through all of this. Last week, the First Minister stood there and told this chamber nine times that her Justice Secretary did nothing but ask a few questions. But we now know that is not true. We know that he made it clear that the SPA's decision was wrong. She says that Mr Matheson didn't instruct the process, but we now know that the SPA's former chair left his second meeting with the Justice Secretary, feeling that he had no choice but to overturn the authorities' decision. Last week, the First Minister stood here and told me that Michael Matheson did not intervene. But doesn't the evidence of this morning show that it's a different story there? Doesn't it make clear that bluntly, the Justice Secretary leaned on the SPA. Yes. First Minister. The greatest of respect, it shows no such thing. Andrew Flanagan, the former chair of the SPA, actually said at the committee this morning that he hadn't been requested by the Justice Secretary to change 
his decision. He had no option, in his view, but to change his decision because he couldn't answer the most basic questions Absolutely. about the process that had been followed. But again, we come back to the nub of this issue. And, you know, Ruth Davidson has changed ground with every single question that she's asked today. But the nub of this issue is this one. If Ruth Davidson is saying that the Justice Secretary should not have asked these questions, should not have acted in the way that he did, then by definition, she must be saying that the Chief Constable should simply have been allowed to return to work, no matter the fact that none of these basic steps had been followed. So Ruth Davidson keeps saying that nine times last week uh, that I said I thought the Justice Secretary had behaved entirely appropriately. I've said it several times again today. So let me say it one more time. The Justice Secretary acted entirely appropriately. He acted in the interest of the people of Scotland and faced with the same circumstances again, he would do the same and ask the same legitimate questions all over again. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Last week I raised uh, with the First Minister the Save Our Build campaign. These are elderly people uh, facing eviction from their homes. The First Minister said that her Health Secretary would meet with the campaigners as a matter of urgency. But today's Courier newspaper reports that campaigners are still waiting. So can the First Minister update the Chamber on what progress has been made? First Minister. Yes, I can actually. Uh, Shona Robson's private office have, over the course of uh, the last week, made a number of offers of meeting times that the group were, for no doubt, understandable reasons, unable to accept. Uh, last night, the Health Secretary spoke directly to one of the campaigners uh, seeking to organise uh, a meeting. She wanted to ensure that she had their views before she met with Beald, uh, as she did earlier this morning, but during that meeting, uh, the Health Secretary arranged to meet with representatives of the campaign, and that meeting will take place on the 6th of February. Richard Leonard. Uh, can I thank the First Minister uh, uh, for that answer, and I hope that we can see uh, an early and satisfactory resolution to this. Because when a government makes a promise to the people, it's important that that promise is kept, not least not least, Order. can we hear the question, please? Not, not least when it comes to the well-being of people's families. So on the 1st of May 2016, the First Minister told Gordon Clark on national television there were no proposals to close the children's ward at the Royal Alexandra Hospital in Paisley. And now, now, less than two years later, her government is closing this children's ward down. Mr. Clark is here today in the gallery. So will the First Minister take this opportunity to apologise to Mr. Clark for misleading him? First Minister. It's interesting that Richard Leonard uh, today says that uh, back in... Uh, May uh, 2016, uh, I gave uh, a commitment about the Royal Alexandra uh, Hospital and the Children's Ward there. It's interesting because this is uh, what Labour uh, said about that after that debate. Uh, they said that during that debate, I had been asked to give a guarantee to protect those services and I refused to give uh, the guarantee. So they appear to have... Uh, that, that, was Neil, that was Neil Bibby for the avoidance uh, of doubt. But on the substance of the issue, because actually this is a far more important issue than simply political interchanges and exchanges. The Health Secretary updated Parliament earlier this week on the decision around Ward 15 at the Royal Alexandra Hospital. She said, and I think she was right to say it, that it is possibly the most difficult decision she has had to make as Health Secretary, and that is entirely understandable. Every decision that affects... Uh, the interests of children and particularly the health of children should be a difficult one for ministers to make. She arrived at the decision she did, uh, having taken into account a range of views, including the very important views of parents, but arrived at that decision based on clinical evidence. And I think it is 
uh, worth noting uh, what the uh, lead paediatric clinicians, the chief nurse for paediatrics at the Royal Alexandra and the Royal Hospital for Children uh, said uh, earlier this week. Uh, they think the change will help implement the standards that the Royal College of Paediatricians and Child Health set to ensure the high quality health care is delivered to children and that the implementation of those standards will contribute to better outcomes for children and young people. That's the clinical advice that drove the decision. Of course, the Health Secretary attached conditions uh, to that decision. Uh, firstly, that the board must maintain and develop community-based paediatric services and maximise local provision. And secondly, that they must work directly with families from the Paisley area on specific individual treatment plans. Uh, and these plans must be in place before any service changes are made. Uh, so as uh, this matter moves forward, the interests and the health of children uh, will be absolutely paramount at every stage. Richard Leonard. Yeah, well, I hope that the uh, First Minister listens to expert opinion when it comes to things like mesh implants as well. Yeah. The, uh, the First Minister needs to understand... <laughs> the First Minister needs to understand the depth of anger about this. This is not just about party politics, it's about her integrity. People feel betrayed. People feel betrayed with good reason. Campaigners, campaigners who were accused of lying. SNP politicians who were more interested in saving the local McDonald's than saving the local children's ward. And when a decision, and when a decision was finally made, it was sneaked out on a Friday afternoon. This government tried to bury bad news in the middle of a snowstorm. So, First Minister, why should the people, why should the people dependent on the veil of Leaven, the parents dependent on the children's ward at St John's, why should they trust you now and why should the people of Paisley ever trust you again? First Minister. Firstly, on, on the manner of the announcement, the Health Secretary stood up in this chamber earlier this week, set out the reasons for her decision uh, and answered a range of questions from across the chamber. That's uh, exactly right and proper. Uh, and on the issue of uh, substance here, as we have always done, as we did uh, when first in government we saved uh, Monklands and Air Accident and Emergency Services from the closure planned by Labour, we will always take these decisions, and these are never easy decisions for any health secretary, on the basis of best clinical evidence. Uh, let me uh, quote uh, Philip Davis, a, a consultant paediatrician, who, when he was interviewed uh, after the health secretary announced the decision, uh, and what he said uh, is this, if children are seriously unwell, then having the backup facilities uh, of things like the paediatric intensive care unit, theatres, specialist medical and surgical specialties at the Royal Hospital for Children, uh, things that are not available in Ward 15, that means we can start definitive care for sick children at a much earlier stage. That is the clinical evidence uh, that underpinned uh, and drove the decision. Uh, the charity Action for Sick Children uh, Scotland, they said the, the compelling argument is that clinical standards are there to support the best quality health care and we feel that this would best be achieved by moving Ward 15 to the Royal Hospital for Children. So that's the evidence that drove the Health Secretary's decision. But the concern about local access is an important one. And absolutely the concerns about parents require to continue to be addressed. That's why the conditions that the Health Secretary attached to the decision are so important. Firstly, about development of community-based services. And secondly, the board requiring to work with individual families on individual treatment plans. These conditions are important and the Health Secretary will ensure that those conditions are both met uh, before any service change proposal goes ahead. Thank you. We have a couple of supplement, uh, constituency questions. The first from Jenny Gilruth. On Monday this week, Murray & Murray Limited, a kitchens manufacturer in Glenrothes, went into liquidation with the loss of 40 jobs. The company has also left several customers in the lurch as they demanded upfront payment. Can the First Minister advise me what support the Scottish Government can give to my constituents affected by these job losses and by Murray and Murray's unfinished work? First Minister. Well, can I thank Jenny Gilruth for raising this issue? Obviously, at a time like this, our thoughts are very much with those who uh, work for uh, a company in these uh, situations, uh, in this case, Murray. We will look to work with the company to 
uh, minimise uh, any threat to employment and of course if there are uh, redundancies in prospect uh, PACE, our organisation that deals with these things, will work uh, with affected employees to make sure that we help them into alternative employment. But this is a difficult time for all concerned and the Scottish Government will do everything it possibly can to assist. Tom Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The, the latest quarterly figures show that 536 referrals to a pain clinic in the Grampian Health Board, only 51 were seen for the first appointment within the 18-week target. And clinicians in HMS, NHS Grampian have confirmed the waiting time for the new routine appointment is now 40 weeks. So can I ask the First Minister, when should patients expect to see reductions in their waiting times? First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government will, as uh, we already do, continue to work with health boards to make sure that uh, patients who need care uh, achieve that care timorously. And uh, I know uh, in terms of pain clinics how important it is for patients to access those services uh, and to access them speedily. Uh, I will ask the Health Secretary to look into the specific issue uh, that the member has raised and uh, get back to him in writing. Uh, and you know, I absolutely readily acknowledge that these are important issues that are raised. Question number three, Willie Rennie. First Minister hides when she has been found out. She usually hides behind the NHS in England or the NHS in Wales. But today it's a new law. She's hiding behind Scotland's doctors. Doctors may have advised her to close the children's ward at Paisley, but they did not force her to lie in that election TV debate. Is, is she not ashamed? Is she not ashamed of blaming the doctors Second. for her broken promise? Order, please. Order, please. Order, please. Order, please. Mr. Rennie, just be careful with the use of your language, please. <laughs> Mr. Rennie, you can finish the question. I'm not, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure anybody heard the end of your question. There was so much noise. If you just finish the end of your question. I'll ask the end of my question again, President Officer. Is she not ashamed? Is the First Minister not ashamed of blaming the doctors for her broken promise? First Minister. But I, think, I think all we've learned from that question is that Willie Rennie is a pathetic attention seeker. Um, and given the, given the state of his... Given the state of his party, it's perhaps not surprising. Let me return... Let me return to the substance of, of the issue. The proposal on the children's ward at the Royal Alexandra Hospital uh, came to the Scottish Government almost a full year after the debate uh, that Willie Rennie is talking about. Um, but secondly, you know, Willie Rennie accuses, accuses me of hiding. I'm standing in the chamber of the Scottish <laughs> Parliament asking questions on this and a whole range of other issues. But I happen to think, and you know, maybe this is just a difference between Willie Rennie and I, I happen to think, uh, and I was health secretary for five years, that when decisions are being taken about really important uh, matters of health service provision, it is important to listen to the experts on the front line, to listen to the doctors and the nurses, who actually, with the greatest of respect to Willie Rennie, know probably more than he does about how best to care for some of the sickest children in our society. Um, so yes, we listened to the doctors and presiding officer, I'm sorry if it upsets Willie Rennie, but I am not prepared to apologize for listening to doctors who know best about how to treat sick children in this country. Uh, before, Mr. Rennie, before order, please. I'm sorry, Mr. Rennie. Hold on a second. I'm sorry. But indulging that level of clapping does not impress anybody. Could you please, please keep that to a, a minimum. But at the moment. What we've just had, and can I just say to both participants and to the Chamber, the, the use of language like this does not, it does not do anybody any favours whatsoever. Personal accusations, the use of the word lying in particular, Mr Rennie, is a word you have to be extremely careful about, but it does not help for the First Minister to rebut by using personal accusations back. Can we please...
I shouldn't have to remind anybody in this chamber that you should treat, treat each other with respect. You are here to talk about the issues, not to indulge in personal accusations across this chamber. Now, please, would both participants bear that in mind in framing the question and in framing the answer? Mr Rennie. President Officer, I was there. I was standing right next to Nicola Sturgeon when she said what she had said. The First Minister led everyone to believe that the children's ward at Paisley was safe in her hands. That's what was pathetic. She said she would always stand up for local services, but now she's shutting them down. So let me ask her this. Does she feel guilty for misleading the parents of sick children? First Minister. What said in that debate was that there was no proposal on that ward. There was at that time no proposal on exactly. that ward. Exactly. There had been no clinical evidence presented. Exactly. Uh, that changed over the course uh, of the months that followed. And I come back to this, it's, it's, it's actually quite a similar exchange uh, to the one with Ruth Davidson in, in some ways, because uh, I suppose the opposition, so intent as they are, and it's their job in attacking the government, they actually fail to follow through on the logic of what they're saying. So Ruth Davidson, so keen to attack Michael Matheson, that she forgets the logic of her question is that she would have allowed something indefensible to happen. And what Willie Rennie is saying here is that we should have, we should have, the health secretary should have stood against all of the clinical evidence of the nurses and the paediatricians who care for sick children. I know how difficult these issues are. I know how difficult they are for parents. There can be nothing worse uh, than being the parent of a desperately sick child. But that makes it all the more important that we listen to expert advice to make sure we have the best possible services in place for sick children. And that is what the Health Secretary has done. Thank you very much. We have a number of constituencies, a number of supplementaries, I should say. The first is from Jamie Green. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, this week is proving to be quite a miserable week for rail travellers in Scotland. Uh, Landslip has closed the Glasgow to Edinburgh line. The West Highland line was closed after derailment. Landslides are affecting cross-country services near Kilmarnock. Flooding and debris is causing problems right across the network, all causing disruption to tens of thousands of commuters. We can't control the weather, but can I ask the First Minister if she is confident if she's confident that our rail work network was adequately winterproofed and ready for this adverse weather, and can she provide an update to Parliament when these services will be operational again? First Minister. Uh, well, it has been an incredibly difficult week for uh, those who work on uh, our railways and indeed for those who travel on our railways. Uh, the member has gone through some of the reasons for that, uh, mainly weather related. But that's actually why it is such a tribute to those working on our railways that as of 8.30 uh, this morning, uh, performance across the rest of the Scottish network, uh, with the exception of Edinburgh Glasgow, which I'll come on to in a second, uh, against uh, the performance measure was 91%. Uh, that's a, a good performance, uh, and I think those uh, who have delivered it deserve uh, our credit. Of course, there have been challenges uh, caused by the weather. Uh, the most serious and significant of those, of course, is the closure of the Edinburgh Glasgow railway line because of the landslip that occurred uh, in a cutting near the village of Filpston which was caused by very heavy rainfall at around uh, noon yesterday. Uh, a work plan has been agreed uh, and implemented for the reinstatement of the railway. Uh, that is planned to be completed this afternoon. However, uh, as members will understand, that will be subject to an inspection of the signalling cables which were buried uh, in the landslip. So these are uh, difficult circumstances for passengers. I want to uh, thank the travelling public for the patience they display. I deeply regret uh, when there is inconvenience caused, but I'm sure uh, most reasonable people know that uh, some of these weather-related incidences cannot be avoided. Our job is to make sure things get back on track as quickly as possible, and that's exactly what is happening. Kezia Dugdale. Thank you. First Minister, the Scottish Sports Association is an independent member-led organisation that supports voluntary sport. And the government's decision to remove their funding has been met with widespread, widespread dismay and anger. Every single opposition member of this chamber has signed a motion to that effect. 
So given there's no majority in this chamber for this decision, will the First Minister urgently revisit this cut and live by her personal promise to champion Scottish sport? First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government has a good relationship with the SSA. We strongly appreciate the support it provides. Uh, the Sports Minister... The Sports Minister uh, this week met with the SSA and indeed representatives of the cross-party group on sport uh, to discuss how we develop a sustainable financial future for the SSA. Aileen Campbell has been clear that we can continue to consider ways in which the SSA can have a sustainable future that supports uh, collaborative working to create uh, the Act of Scotland that all of us want to see. Uh, so we will continue to take uh, these deliberations uh, forward and I hope we can uh, get to a, a good position uh, that is good for the SSA as well as sport in general. I would remind uh, the Chamber of course that we invest heavily in sport uh, generally with the draft budget committee to increasing the funding for Sports Scotland by £2 million. We've also pledged to underwrite any potential shortfall in national lottery funding for Sports Scotland up to £3.4 million to provide certainty for the sports sector in the absence of action uh, from the UK Government. So we will continue to take uh, decisions that are in the interest of developing sport across our country. Miles Briggs. Presiding officer, um, First Minister, GPs across Scotland, especially in rural Scotland, are concerned at the impact the new GP contract will have on their practices. Under the proposed contract, one rural GP in Argyll and Butte is set to lose 87% of their funding. I think all of us would agree that's an unacceptable situation. Many GPs feel that the Scottish Government has, is set now to set rural GPs against urban GPs. Can I therefore make a positive suggestion to the First Minister and the Health Secretary to pause the contract until this Parliament's Health and Sport Committee has had the opportunity to properly scrutinise the new GP contract so that we can make sure that it does not destabilise what is already a crisis for general practice across Scotland. First Minister. Well, of course, last week uh, the overwhelming majority of GPs voted to accept the new GP contract and I warmly welcome that. I think that is good for the profession. I also think it will be good uh, for patients. Uh, on the issues uh, around rural GPs, of course we must listen to these. That's why a short life working group has uh, been established to look specifically at those uh, issues. Uh, of course, members don't have to simply listen to the Scottish Government on this. It's the position of the BMA uh, that those concerns being expressed by rural GPs are unfounded and that no GP will lose funding as a result of the new contract. That is the reality of the situation, but I accept we have to convince rural GPs that that is the case and we will continue to work collaboratively with them uh, to seek to do exactly that. Question number four, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to increase the uptake of screening for early diagnosis of cervical cancer. First Minister. Cervical screening saves around 5,000 lives uh, a year. It prevents up to 8 out of 10 cervical cancers. Uh, we've invested in a national campaign to promote screening generally. £5 million of funding from our cancer strategy has been invested in our screening programmes, including cervical screening, to encourage those who are eligible to take up their invite. We are also supporting the work of charities like Joe's Cervical Cancer Trust to increase awareness of screening and address some of the barriers. To enable the charity to extend their reach, we're funding their new outreach service, which targets women less likely to attend. Uh, thanks to cervical screening and, of course, the HPV vaccination programme, cervical cancer is now preventable, and that is a good thing. Kenneth Gibson. <coughs> I thank the First Minister for that answer. Cervical cancer is the most common cancer in women under 35, and yet a recent survey by Joe's Cervical Cancer Trust found that more than three out of five, some 61% were unaware that they are in the most at-risk age group for the disease. Indeed, a quarter of eligible women aged 25 to 64 do not currently take up their invitation for a smear test, rising to one third among 25 to 29 year olds. The reason behind this is largely self-consciousness and embarrassment. Are there any measures being taken to reduce the apparent stigma which seems to surround cervical screening, especially among the younger women? And would you agree with the Health Secretary, as she simply put it, that screening does save lives? First Minister. Well, yes, I, I do absolutely agree with that. We, we know that there are barriers uh, to women accessing 
cervical screening. Uh, those barriers include fear, pain, often embarrassment. As a, a woman, I not only understand uh, those concerns, I absolutely identify uh, with them. Uh, that's why it's very important that we continue to talk to each other and uh, support and encourage each other uh, to understand the importance of screening. Uh, at government level, to help overcome some of these barriers, as I it said a moment ago, we are investing in a high-profile awareness uh, raising campaign, uh, helping to generate conversations about these issues. Uh, we're also supporting the work of local activities and communities to open up a dialogue about cervical screening, uh, helping women to fully understand why the test is so important uh, and make it the norm to attend uh, when appointment letters are issued. Uh, we'll continue to raise awareness and work uh, to address stigma uh, as taking up screening for uh, many women uh, is nothing short of a matter uh, of life or death. Question five, Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking in response to reports that two-thirds of teachers do not feel they have had sufficient training in supporting the mental health of their pupils. First Minister. Uh, we believe that every child and young person should have access to emotional and mental wellbeing support in school, so we want to ensure that all teachers and staff are confident in supporting their needs. Mental health first aid training is currently being delivered to school staff within secondary school communities by Education Scotland in partnership with NHS Health Scotland. In addition, as part of the 10-year mental health strategy, we've begun work to implement an improved mental health training service for everyone who supports young people in schools. Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you, First Minister, for that answer. I'd like to push a bit more, if I may. Schools across Scotland are understaffed and overstretched, and teachers want nothing more than to support their pupils. Therefore, the, given that only one in a hundred teachers recall doing any detailed work on mental health in their initial teacher education, will the Scottish Government give a commitment to this chamber for mental health to be comprehensively covered in all teacher education? First Minister. I've certainly uh, asked the Education Secretary to look at what more we can do around uh, teacher training. I think it's an important point. I think it's uh, vitally important that teachers at the very early stage of their career understand the importance uh, of mental health. Uh, we continue to take the action uh, I spoke about in my earlier answer. Uh, in December, uh, we also announced funding uh, in a youth commission uh, on mental health, which will be delivered in partnership between Sam H and Young Scott. Uh, which will provide recommendations on the way forward for uh, CAMS services and support. We also uh, provide funding to Childline to provide confidential advice and information to children uh, and young people. So these are important matters that we will continue uh, to take forward. And it's because these matters are so important, of course, uh, that we're putting forward a budget to this parliament that increases uh, funding for our National Health Service, uh, that ensures that teachers uh, get more uh, funding directly to them in our schools. And I, I would simply say, to the member. Uh, if he believes that our schools uh, are stretched, as he said, then he please should not support proposals in the forthcoming discussions of our budget that would remove £500 million pounds from the money this government's got to invest. And Claire Hockey. Thank you, President Officer, and can I refer members to my register of interest as a registered mental health nurse. Can the First Minister outline what other actions her government is taking to improve the mental health and wellbeing of our children and young people, and also what role the mental health strategy plays in this? First Minister. Well, the mental health strategy plays a key role in this, and of course that strategy is backed by investment of £150 million over five years, and it sets out how we can improve early intervention and ensure better access to services, including uh, for young people. As I said in response to the previous question, we're also funding a range of initiatives uh, to involve young people in these discussions about mental health. The funding uh, I spoke about a moment ago in the Youth Commission and the funding for Childline. So we will continue to take steps like this to make sure sure that we're focusing on prevention, which is the most important thing, uh, but also making sure we've got the services in place for those who need them. Question six, Neil Bibby. To ask the First Minister when the children's ward at the Royal Alexandra Hospital will close. First Minister. Well, as I said earlier on, the Health Secretary approved the Board's proposals uh, on two conditions. Firstly, that the Board maintains and develops community-based paediatric services uh, and maximises local provision. And secondly, that they must work directly with families on specific individual treatment plans. Uh, these plans must be in place before any service changes are made and will ensure that there is a full understanding of what services and support will be available to local families uh, and from where. The Board has given an assurance that there will be no change made to the service until these individual patient plans are added please. Neil Bibby. Presiding officer, my community understands there is a debate to be had about localisation and specialisation. 
But in an area as sensitive as children's services, the least they deserve is an honest debate. During an election, the First Minister gave a calculated and cynical answer that she thought she could get away with. You're right, I didn't trust your answer. I thought you were trying to mislead people, and I've been proven right. That over the last week, the Health Secretary tried to sneak her decision out on a Friday afternoon. Local SNP politicians, the once accused scare, uh, campaigners of scaremongering, now applaud the decision in the Chamber. And on two occasions, the Health Secretary has snubbed an invite to meet the parents who will have to live with her decision. Does the First Minister understand why so many people, like Gordon Clark, who is here today, feel betrayed? And what will she learn and change from the disgraceful way her government and her party have treated the people of Paisley? First Minister. I, I don't agree with or accept that characterisation. But in actual fact, the substance of this issue is what matters most. The Health Secretary met with parents uh, twice before uh, reaching the decision. I understand the Chair of uh, the Health Board wants to organise a meeting uh, with parents to discuss the, the, the individual uh, patient plans that are going to be put in place. The Health Secretary is happy to attend uh, that. So ongoing engagement with parents uh, is vitally important. But, you know, Neil Baby asked me what lessons uh, are learned all along in these decisions and as everybody who has been in the position of taking this, these decisions knows these are never easy decisions um, and health secretaries have to look at the evidence in the round the, the views of parents are hugely important but ultimately this is about providing the best services uh, for sick children I've already quoted a number of clinicians I'm, I'm sorry I don't think uh, views like that from experts from uh, specialist clinicians should be ignored uh, and that's the basis of of the decision but what is also important are the community services that are provided and that's where I think parents uh, are absolutely right to continue to ask questions that's why the conditions attached to this decision are so important and why the health secretary will make sure both of those conditions are met in full before any service change proceeds question number seven Bill Kidd presiding officer um to ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government is marking Holocaust Memorial Day. First Minister. Well, we must never forget the horrors of the Holocaust and other genocides around the world. Uh, they are a stark reminder of the inhumanity and violence that bigotry and intolerance can wreak if left unchallenged. Uh, last night, I was honoured to speak at this year's national event to mark International Holocaust Memorial Day, which took place at Glasgow Caledonian University. Uh, and I commend Interfaith Scotland and the Holocaust Memorial Trust for their excellent work in organising this event. Uh, I know that members across the chamber will be marking the day in different ways, uh, and we must continue to stand shoulder to shoulder in challenging hatred and promoting a world where everyone lives with fundamental human dignity. Bill Kidd. I thank the First Minister for that answer and recognise the support the Scottish Government gives to the Holocaust Educational Trust. I also thank, uh, if you don't mind, uh, the presiding officer for his support of the Holocaust Educational Trust in Parliament this week. I, as stated earlier, the Deputy First Minister was deeply affected by his recent visit to Auschwitz with 200 Scottish school pupils and colleagues from across this chamber have been moved by their visits to Srebrenica and other sites of genocide and persecution across the world. Such terrible atrocities remind us of man's inhumanity to man, but those lost to us will never be forgotten. Will the government continue to support projects in our schools, giving Scotland's young people the chance to remember, to learn and to play their part in consigning intolerance and genocide to the history books forever? First Minister. As the Deputy First Minister said just in advance of First Minister's questions, I think the role of education here is vitally important and can never be uh, overstated. Uh, I uh, listened again uh, last night to a very impressive young woman who had uh, been part of the school's programme visiting Auschwitz. I've uh, heard the testimony of many uh, of those young people who've done so in the past and it never fails uh, to have an impact and uh, to, to deeply move. Um, I've not had uh, the opportunity yet to uh, visit Auschwitz myself. The Deputy First Minister did so recently. I, I certainly hope to have that opportunity in the future. Uh, but around 18 months ago, I did take the opportunity to visit Srebrenica. Uh, and, uh, you know, I knew 
uh, in theory uh, a lot about the Bosnian genocide, but it wasn't until uh, visiting the site of it, uh, to visiting the memorial, to talking to uh, some of those affected, uh, some of those bereaved, some of the survivors, that the true impact of that is really felt. And that's an experience I know others across the chamber have also had it that will live with me for the rest of my life. Uh, I think it becomes more important with every year that passes uh, from the, the Second World War in particular, uh, that this uh, remembrance continues. Uh, we must make sure the, the next generation never forgets. Um, and that's why Holocaust Memorial Day and all the events that go around it are so important. Uh, the, the theme, of course, this year is the power uh, of words. And perhaps all of us uh, have been reminded today, presiding officer, that we could all learn lessons uh, about that. Uh, words uh, have, have great power, so we should be careful, all of us, uh, how we, we choose them. Uh, but let's, uh, perhaps at the very end of First Minister's questions today, uh, notwithstanding all the many things that divide us uh, as a chamber, that divide us uh, as a country and as a society, come together uh, and remember uh, the power uh, and the importance of our common humanity. Uh, this is Holocaust Memorial Week. Of course, today is also uh, the day we celebrate the birthday of our National Bard. And it is quite appropriate that those two things are in such close proximity, because in many ways, Robert Burns uh, personifies that humanity. Uh, so, man to man, the world ours shall brothers be for all that. Thank you very much. I would thank all members for their participation. That concludes First Minister's questions. We turn now to members' business. In the name of Maurice Golden, we'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.